Hey hey, what is up guys, it is Orby in Hardware and in today's video we're gonna build the best bad yet 1440p gaming PC for March of 2021 using the following parts. I'm gonna show you exactly step by step how to put this complete PC build together and then we're gonna test it out in 15 of the most popular games in both 1440p ultra settings but also at 4k resolution. Now we also take a look at what kind of frame rate you can expect having ray tracing turned on as well. Now if you wanna build the exact PC2. All parts I'm using are linked up down below. But before we get into the video, hey, my name is Robin, and on this channel, I turn you into a PC builder expert. And so, if that is something you're interested in, smash the like button below for the YouTube algorithm and hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell and let me know what price target we should cover next. And speaking of price target, this machine will cost you right about $1,000 using the following parts. Now for $1,000 you will be able to play all games at 1080p, 1440p, at max settings with great frame rate, but even 4K gaming is definitely possible too. Now taking a quick sneak peek at the performance shows that we're able to run all games tested with very good results. But yeah, we're gonna dive into the gaming performance in much greater detail after we completed the build. Anyway, inside this machine we find a 3rd gen 6 core Ryzen CPU, an RTX 3070 graphics card, as well as a super fast M.2 drive, 16 gigabytes of RAM, everything housed inside this massive Lian Lee case. Now remember to smash the like button and let me know down below what other games I should include for my benchmarks in future videos. Alright, so as always I like to start with CPU, RAM and motherboard and for today's build I ended up picking the MSI B450 Tomahawk Max coming in at $115, mainly because, yeah, I did want a little bit of RGB to look at through the temper glass side panel, but yeah, $115 is, uh, yeah, it is definitely on the higher end and there is uh, really no reason to spend over $100 on the motherboard except if you're looking for, you know, a specific feature that you're willing to spend extra for. One board that I think ticks all the boxes and got all the bells and whistles is the Gigabyte B450M. This is selling for just $74. This has a slightly smaller form factor, but it will work just as good for this PC build. And just to be extra transparent with you guys, you will get the same exact frame rate with this motherboard as well. And so if you want to shred off a couple of dollars, Pick the B450M and both motherboards will be linked up down below. So with that said, let's take a look at the processor coming in at $199. This is a 6 core CPU with SMT which means that it got 12 threads and it has a base clock of 3.8 and a 4 point gigahertz turbo. And I'm obviously talking about the highly popular Ryzen 5 3600. Having a look at the CPU performance, we see that the 3600 is a very compelling CPU. Thanks to Zen 2's low latency, high clock speed and high IPC, the $199 3600 doesn't disappoint and it's the perfect pick for a PC build with a graphics card priced around 450 US dollars or above. Now as we can see our motherboard comes with the retention frame pre-installed but since we're gonna use a cooler that uses springs yeah we're gonna get rid of the retention frame from the motherboard. Now installing the CPU in the socket is easy. First you want to open up the metal arm. Secondly you want to locate what's looking like a golden triangle on the processor. Taking a greater look at the motherboard socket we see that we find an exact triangle printed here as well. And so what you want to do is you want to simply turn the CPU so that these triangles match up. Then you simply drop the processor into the socket and gently move the metal arm down until it locks in place and voila! Yeah, our CPU is now installed. Inside the CPU box also comes an included heatsink or cooler. Now the included stock cooler is actually really not that bad if you aren't interested in doing, you know, heavy overclocking. And I actually don't see any reasons not to use it as it will save us a couple of dollars. Now the cooler installment is also very simple. Now, if you haven't used the CPU cooler before, it should have some thermal grease pre-applied and you don't need to apply and the thermal grease on the CPU lid as you see I'm doing right now. Position the CPU cooler so that the four spring screws on the heatsink align with the four holes on the backplate. 
Once aligned, carefully place the heatsink onto the CPU. Using a screwdriver, turn each spring screw half a turn clockwise to ensure the spring screw makes a connection with the backplate. Follow a diagonal pattern across the CPU cooler like this to further tightening each spring screw with a full turn. With the spring screws connected to the backplate, tighten them until you feel resistance. Then check the CPU cooler to ensure that it's uh, properly secured to the motherboard. Lastly, don't forget to connect the fan power cable to the CPU cooler to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. For RAM, we're gonna go with the Corsair Vengeance RGB because of its stellar quality and compatibility with the Ryzen platform. But there are a few other picks out there that I would highly recommend as well, and those are linked up down below. Now, these sticks are rated at 3200MHz, which has proven to be a sweet spot for any Ryzen CPU, as this will give you a frame rate boost compared to any other slower clock kit. And this is because of the way that the CPU and RAM communicate with each other. Installing these bad boys is as simple as it actually looks. And so, we're gonna wanna populate the gray slot, so simply pull back the toggle for the second and the fourth dim slot and plug them in just like so. Now, compared to a traditional hard drive, the Kingston A2000 is about 35x faster, which is just insane. Now, in order to install this M.2 drive, we wanna locate the M.2 slot, which we find right here. And so what you want to do is you want to loosen this tiny screw just like so, then gently slide the M.2 unit into the socket with this little notch you see here on the opposite side of the CPU cooler just like so. Finally take the little screw and hold it down and screw it down all the way until it stops. Now we can go ahead and move our motherboard assembly and install it in our case. And in today's build, I ended up picking the Lian Li Long Cool 2 for about $99. Now, this massive footprint of a case comes with not just one, but two side tempered glass side panels mounted on hinges and magnets. Very, very clever. Now, in order to keep the other side of the case looking nice and tidy, we find nifty cable management panels that hides the ugly cables you don't want to see. Very nice, Lee and Lee. Now, for maximum airflow, we find three 120mm P installed fans and the option of adding a whole bunch more if you want to. In the front, as we can see, we find plenty of cutouts, allowing heaps of air into the case, but yeah, for optimal airflow, Lee and Lee also sells a mesh variant of this case as well. And so if you're looking for a case with even better airflow, I highly recommend having a look at the mesh variant, and you'll find this case linked up down below. Now, on top of all of this, we also find RGB here, and this can be customized using the buttons at the front. So in order to prep the case, there's a couple of things we gotta do. In order to get access to the inside, the first thing we're gonna wanna do is we wanna flip open the hard drive shroud in order to open up the tamper glass side window. Next thing, we gonna wanna install a IO shield that we find inside our motherboard box. This one goes in from the back of the case with these circular audio ports located at the bottom. Now with the CPU cooler installed, we can just grab onto the CPU fan and slide the whole assembly into place. Now one standoff in the middle is sort of higher than the other ones which allows the motherboard to lock in place while we secure it. And we're gonna use the screws that comes provided by MSI. And with the board installed before we move on to power supply and graphics, now is a good time to connect the chassis cables that takes care of the front audio and USB, as well as the power button. And let's start with USB 3. And this is what this cable looks like. The connector is located down at the bottom of the motherboard. Next in line we have the front audio, and this one goes to the left side corner. Lastly, we have the front panel connectors, and you find this on the lower right side. With that done and clear, let's go ahead and install our power supply. And for today's build, I chose this 650 watt unit from Corus Air. This is a compact, silent, and semi-modular quality PSU with 80 plus bronze efficiency certification, coming in at around $74. We're gonna need to connect these uh, two additional cables to the power supply. First one is the PCIe connector, 
this is for a graphics card and the second one is the SATA power for the RGB. Simply take each cable and plug it in onto the back of our power supply. You want to make sure that the fan is facing downwards, then gently slide it into place and secure it. Now we're gonna do a couple of cables and wiring before installing our graphics. And first up we got the 24 pin power for our motherboard and this one goes to a connector that we find on the mid right side. Next up we got this 8 pin power and this is for our CPU and this one goes all the way up to the top left side corner. Also you don't want to forget to connect a free SATA power cable and this is for the fan hub and the RGB. Alright so the moment we've been waiting for, time to install the graphics and for today's build we find the brand new Ampere based RTX 3070. This one specifically from Gigabyte equipped with their WinForce 3X cooler. Now the 3060 is based on the brand new GA104 GPU, same one as we find inside the 3060 Ti, but this one has got plenty of more CUDA cores, and in terms of specifications it comes with 8 gigs of G6 memory and plenty of so called RT cores for silky smooth gameplay, even with ray tracing activated. Now the GPU has an MSRP of $499 and this is what I think the card is worth. I don't think you should spend much more than that. However, right now the prices for GPUs in general have spiked way higher on pretty much any GPU out there because of low current supply. Now, although we hope the situation gets better any day now, remember guys, as much as you want to build a PC right now, don't spend more than what Nvidia is pricing it. And $499 is the MSRP for this model and I simply don't recommend you guys spending hundreds of dollars more. Anyway, as I briefly mentioned at the beginning of this video, the 3070 is a fantastic 1440p and 4K graphics card and more on this in a second. Plug in the graphics card and take these dual PCIe cables and plug it into a graphics card just like so. And what is left to do is to flip the case around, whack on the side panel and we have officially completed our $1000 gaming PC build. And if you did everything right, your system should power on. And so with that said, let's fire up some games and find out how this PC performs. On your screen now, we're looking at the performance numbers that I've gathered from today's build and I ended up running 15 games in both 1440p and 4K resolution. And overall guys, I'm quite stoked how this PC performs. But with that said, let's dive a bit deeper with some of the games tested and let's first take a look at Death Stranding. Let's start with 1440p and with an average of around 122 FPS uh, with 1% low at 100 FPS running on the highest setting possible. You can expect silky smooth frame rate running this game on this PC, jumping up to 4K resolution with the same settings we see in around 90 FPS on average and around 80 FPS at 1% low, so again, very solid numbers. Moving on to CSGO, once again at 1440p at max settings gives us about 285 FPS on average. Jumping to 4K at same graphic settings results in about 245 FPS. Doom Eternal is next and once again I'm picking the highest possible settings, which is called Ultra Nightmare. And starting at 1440p, this results in about 122 FPS on average and approximately 100 FPS at 1% low. At 4K resolution, we're averaging around 70 to 74 FPS. Moving on to Overwatch, and here I'm picking ultra settings for this title. This results in about 152 FPS on average and around 123 FPS at 1% low. Again, at 1440p. At 4K resolution, we're still averaging around 144 FPS and about 119 FPS at 1% low. And we're using the epic settings once again. Valorant runs incredibly well with an average of over 200 FPS. And looking at the settings, I went for everything maxed out at 1440p. At 4K resolutions, things didn't change much. We're still almost 200 FPS on the average. Call of Duty Warzone at 1440p runs at 116 FPS on average, using the highest possible settings. And this is with DX12 and ray tracing on. 
At 4K resolution we saw around 60 FPS on average and once again with ray tracing activated. Moving on to Cyberpunk 2077, another title that also supports ray tracing and having it activated using the medium ray tracing settings we saw around 71 FPS on average and about 60 FPS at 1% low. And this is at 1440p, whereas in 4K resolution with ray tracing set to medium, and thanks to DLSS ultra performance settings, we were able to reach 62 FPS on average, which is pretty impressive, I have to say. Again, guys, all PC components I'm using in this video can be found down below. If you guys want to become a part of the community and you want to join up the Discord server, here you can hang out and discuss PC builds with other like minded people. And if you have any questions, this is the perfect place to get the answer. You'll find the link to the Discord down below. Now, watch either of these two videos, and I will see you guys in the next video.